long, long day. I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow, and I am Father Matthew Cowth, and we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Ten Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen. Till I know I hello, Father Winslow. Well, hello there. Welcome back to From the Rooftop. And I hope that you are settling in for this conversation because I have something in mind. Which means (laughs) it's going to put you to sleep. (laughs) Well, So grab your uh, cup of coffee or tea, nestle in, and if you're driving, pull over. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I say it because this is probably from the rooftop in, in, in terms of its height, but I do want it to be somewhat practical insofar as giving persons breadcrumbs to be able to follow. But I want to talk a little bit about the Blessed Trinity. And I say that selfishly because I'm at that time in my classes where I'm teaching on this. And I haven't started yet. We're getting into it on Thursday. But I was wondering, I had this line, I read this line from St. Thomas, that he says, Our greatest happiness is found in the knowledge of the Blessed Trinity, and the humanity of Christ. And that's a pretty startling statement. Yeah. And I Especially say it, since all of it is revealed. Right. All of it's revealed. Nothing you can know by the natural light of reason. Right. You're on an island. You could be there for a thousand years and you will never, you come, never come to up any of those truths. Yeah. All of them have to be revealed by God himself. And it got me thinking rather practically too. I mean, I can, I can understand it theoretically in so far as Right, this is the beatific vision. This is what we're made for. It's what we're made to behold, to live and to swim and to drink in eternally. Okay. Okay, all right. Just but right we're gonna now, get there. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. Yeah. But you're saying beholding and living in the Trinity right. is an experience of the beatific vision. Right. So for people just a little unfamiliar with language, vocabulary. Yeah. So when we say that we want to be happy. When we say that we want beatitude, which is just the Latin for happiness, right? And sort of entering into someone else's beatitude. When we read in the scriptures that enter into the joy of your Lord, it's like something objective. It's someone else's blessedness, someone else's beatitude, someone else's um, joy, as it were, Mm -hmm. that we get to enter into. And when we speak about that classically in terms of theology, we speak about beholding God, seeing him face to face. I want to see him. I don't want to see him mediated through an image. I don't want to see him mediated through anything. I want direct contact. But this is, it's not just viewing. This is participation. Yeah, the the difficulty is when you think about the BW vision, you think about all of us standing around, sitting around a campfire. And staring. You see it? Yeah, I see it. You see it? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds very boring. That's viewing or (laughs) observing. Right. And there's something more to it, infinitely more to it. But I... I guess what really struck me about that that phrase by St. Thomas is that I can understand it theologically, but I don't know if hardly any of the faithful experience any of that. And that is to say that the greatest knowledge we can have is the Holy Trinity and the The greatest incarnation. happiness comes from knowing those two realities. The greatest happiness comes from knowing those Which two Which makes realities. sense if that's our beatitude. But what about now? Right? Here and now. Right. How many of us, we, we, tem, we typically tend to avoid the topic because we think to ourselves, ah, it's a mystery. And for us, mystery often means that, you know, I, I just can't know anything about it. Right. There's two ways we use mystery. Right? We use it in a common parlance, with, like a mystery novel, you know. It's pr- unknown. Professor Plum with the lead pipe mm. in the billiard room. That's a mystery that once it's solved, it's not a mystery anymore. But what we mean in theological circles, we typically use in terms of church jargon, is that something we cannot know unless it had been revealed. Mm-hmm. But once it's revealed, we can't comprehend it. Or as a rather pithy way of saying it, is that it's an incomprehensible certitude. It's certain, because God revealed it, 
but I can't comprehend it. But there is something comprehensible because there'd That's be no it. point in revealing no it. No point in revealing it otherwise. So, so that there is some capacity to comprehend the mystery. Right. So what I'm putting at your feet, Father Winslow, oh, since you're, I, I see these summas lying everywhere, <laughs> studying of St. Thomas. <laughs> what I want to lay at your feet is if this is fundamentally the, the place where we get the greatest amount of happiness, joy, beatitude, what do you say to the person who is working a nine to five job? What do you say to the to the to the mom, the dad that's got five or six kids running around? Like if you're not thinking about the Blessed Trinity, you're not thinking about the humanity of Christ, the incarnation of the Son of God, clearly you don't have any beatitude. You have no joy. Hmm. Like, <laughs> well, I'm not sure I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my 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 gut reaction is that they are likely participating in some knowledge and reflection at some level in the Holy Trinity and in the humanity and divinity of Christ. And it may be a basic level. It may be almost a a subconscious level. uh, But I think that if they have any Christian upbringing or background, it's lurking there. Yeah. And perhaps any type of satisfaction and enduring satisfaction or fulfillment that they're having is actually predicated or standing on these realities. Mm. Because everything then is ephemeral. Everything else is just slowly disappearing. Nothing can be retained. And so you have to contend with the futility of every other promise in life of material wealth or goods or reputation or position in society or power or influence or um, popularity. All of those things, I mean, they they don't go with you when you die. And so there has to be at some unconscious level a type of reckoning with the futility of it all. And for somebody who has a Christian background, they're probably, even if only in a rudimentary sense, resting on or standing on this notion that there is God, um, that there's a triune God and God became man. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be as simple as the fact of it, right? You're missing a ton more if you're only grasping the fact of it. But I think the fact of it enables those other things to be at least uh, pacifying. Mm -hmm. Because other. If you reckon with the futility of everything else around you, you're left despairing, aren't you? Yes. I mean, if you if you look at everything you have and you say, it's all going to go away, and I, yeah. I'm going to be left without it all, aren't may- you left despairing? Absolutely. And maybe there's one, one little gangplank we can get across those waters of despair in each of those experiences, which is if, if every single effect... There's another principle of St. Thomas for you. If every single effect resembles its cause, then all those little effusions of of things that we enjoy, the things you just mentioned, Mm -hmm. they look like him. That's why we're attracted to them. Right. And so one of the simple ways, and I hadn't thought about this before we, as usual, before we started talking, I just read that line in St. Thomas (laughs) before I came in here. (laughs) Um, It's a good place to start. It's a good place to start. But I think that Part of, the, part of the trick has got to be referring all of those joys back to the one that they resemble. Follow the breadcrumbs. Follow the breadcrumbs. And it requires the use of reason. I mean, there is, uh, you, you can't just be a passive actor. Well, first of all, none of us are really passive actors in life. But when it comes to the big questions, I think that people tend to be passive actors. I think that they, they just kind of get on with the things that are important to them in the moment or at least in the near future. And they're looking for joy and happiness, you know, through looking for happiness through it all. But they'll put off those larger overarching questions. They'll defer them and not really address them as they should. So they don't follow the breadcrumbs past whatever uh, temporal uh, goalposts they have in mind. Until they're subject to losing them. Until they're subject to losing them. At that point, you say, what is this all about? Yeah. Right, and that's where truly the the punishment of death in Genesis, as a consequence of original sin, is medicinal. Right, 
Right. It doesn't the allow wages. us to avoid yeah. the need to follow the breadcrumbs to something bigger. It doesn't allow us to fall down this pit into a broken state in the whole of original sin and just think, oh, we were born here meant to die and that's all there ever is and all right. there ever was. Right. No, the the fact is the death provokes the question. It does. That we're meant to ask, is this all there is? Right. Is there something beyond? And actually, I, I should have stated that when you fall into that pit of original sin and you end up broken, I should have said, we're not meant just to live here in perpetuity. Right. That we just go on and on and on. Because if we went on and on and on and on, we might just think that's all there is. But the fact that there is a death provokes and evokes provokes. provokes the questions that we need to ask. I remember John Paul II writing in his his uh, Wednesday audiences that became what we know as the theology of the body. Mm-hmm. I remember when, him, when he stated in there that um, the moment you shall eat of it, you shall die. And I never thought of it before, but his, his commentary on that passage in Genesis, to, that, that law that was given to Adam, is that Adam didn't know what death was. Mm-hmm. Like, the, yeah. It's introduced it's good by point. God. But what was death? What was death? You know, that, that oddity one, introduced yeah. as, a, as, a, as a future possible. Because Adam was not created to die. with, de- to de- with yeah. death in mind. God is not rejoiced in the destruction of the living, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't create death. Um, and yet, there's another passage that I like very much in, in Tolkien's Cimmerillion, which is one of his, sort of, his works that's kind of the backstory of all of the Lord of the Rings that people know. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's really worth looking into, mm. but there's these elves that don't die, and there's men that do. And his, his statement in there is that that was, that was God's gift to men. Yeah. Was that they would die. Um, and even, even with Adam, we profess that there would have been some kind of transition relative to the what they experienced in terms of like from a body that is passable to a body that is, is not passable, is not capable of suffering or dying, is right. being broken up into its parts, etc. So if we were to accept the fact that death is God's medicinal gift that makes us look at these big questions, what are the things that we're attracted to and the things that we have greater attraction to once we, once we taste them because they look more like, they're more perfect effects of God. They look more like Him. I mean, I think about as we get older, you know, take yourself, for example. I mean, we've had many conversations about how um, time spent with your family is, is sort of the most precious thing you can do with your time. Mm. Right? And I think we would all say that. Um, that as we get older and we stand to lose members of our family, especially, or we, we, uh, we, we see the, uh, we take delight, as it were, in all their quirks and things in a way that we didn't before. Right. Um, because we were spending so much time when we were younger trying to branch out and get away, and now right. we, we find ourselves wanting to, to return yeah. um, and spend time with them. But because that thing looks more like the Trinity than does the car, the job, the money, the whatever. Those things do look like God to some degree. Right. Insofar as there's a certain kind of power there mm-hmm. and power gives us a certain kind of capacity and influence, whatever else. And, and so there's something to be attracted to there. I can see why we're attracted to those things. Um, pleasure, obviously, is, is made by God. It's not the bad thing in itself. It's the thing that attracts us to do the thing and to do so contrary to, to our own good or the good of others is why it's sinful. But not the pleasure is not sinful. Right. And what are, the, what are the things could we could we mention that the higher up the scale you go, the more that thing looks like a triune God? Because certainly family does. Certainly, I'm also reminded as you speak of Saint Augustine. You know, he's repenting of how he took more delight in the gift than the giver, mm-hmm. which is another way of saying I I didn't follow the breadcrumbs, if you will. Yeah. To the one he gave it. That's it. Um, and I ended up using the gifts that were given in a disordered way, uh, in a way that betrayed the one who gave them. Uh, but and, and he regrets and laments it. Uh, and that reflection is so poignant. But at that moment, he's he's actually he's made the climb, right? He's he's followed those breadcrumbs to the one who gave it, and now he wants to delight in those things as they were intended so as to be a real experience of the one who gave them. 
Yeah. And um, yeah, and so it, it's resonating, I think, with, with yeah, St. Augustine's so experience. Do you think that this is the reason that, that we are afraid of death? Even those of us who profess the faith I mean, certainly we have to be, have some kind of natural fear of it because it wasn't supposed to happen. And so it's, it's the dissolution of soul and body. I mean, the, 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 the breaking up of that, that, that union that makes us who we are. Right. Um, so that's, that's an unnatural state. We should have some kind of natural fear of it. Sure. And yet even faith sometimes doesn't sort of overcome uh, for some. Uh, we've been at the deathbeds of a lot of people. I'm always really impressed when people are not just ignorant or distracting themselves or a lot of morphine, but when they're actually conscious of the fact that they're dying and they're embracing it. That always mm-hmm. is wildly uh, surprising to me, even it though is. I should expect it as a man of faith, right? And I think maybe to some degree the reason that there might be a bit of fear of it is because because I, I'm used to just having the breadcrumbs. Mm. You know, I, I'm used to having the gifts and not the giver. And... I cannot not have the giver on the other side. Even though I'm in, in, logically I would profess that that's what I want if I mm-hmm. want the gifts at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I want the fullness. But there's nowhere to hide there. There's nowhere to say that this thing is mine. Nowhere to say that, that I can have a space that doesn't belong to him. Right. It's either him or it's not him. Right. And I think that's the conversion point that we all have to sort of get to. That I, I don't want the things as much as I want him or the persons even as much as I want him and that's that's I can see why that's a little bit frightening even though it logically it's not I think from an experiential point of view I I'll recount two you know quick stories one goes back to my time when I was a priest in upstate New York and Father Bradley a wonderful man a very devoted priest uh, my first assignment and I was in many ways blessed to have him as a first pastor and um I remember him recalling how he had just been that evening to visit a man that he knew all his life uh, who was dying. And it was not unexpected and it wasn't untimely. And he was recounting a little bit of the conversation he was having with him. In particular, the man said that he was afraid and he didn't understand why he was afraid since he had faith. Yeah, And Father Bradley, just being a... just an, uh, what do you call an old shoe? Is that what they call it? Or what, you, what are those expressions where you're just a uh, when you're when you're just yeah. experienced, right? Yeah. Uh, being the experienced priest that he was, he simply said, "Of course you are. You've never done this before." Yeah, and it was just a, a very simple human way of kind of explaining some of the fear. Of course, you're offering a bit of a metaphysical explanations that were not intended to were not meant to be enduring separate body and soul right. or meant to be together uh, so it speaks more to who we are intended to be and there seems to be reason on that level to have a bit of anxiety but that's also from an experiential point of view I've never done yeah. before now on the flip side I remember having a conversation with a woman who was uh, facing a p- potential diagnosis of a an advanced cancer but the word the final word wasn't in and she was waiting of course that weighs on you every single day uh, thinking that you potentially could get word that you have four months to live. So uh, she came and she spoke with me and I'm not portraying any confidences. uh, And she said, you know, Father, um, the past uh, week I found myself anxious and worried uh, based upon what I might hear next week. She said, but then it struck me just the other day. When you die, you simply lose consciousness. That's the experience of it. She said, I do that every night when I go to bed. Right. This is the goes, dress rehearsal. Exactly. She said, and then suddenly I realized, oh, that's all it is. <laughs> you know, that, that image of the, the eternal state. And, and so it just took a wall of fear away for her. Yeah. So there was something, on the other hand, you can say, you've never done it before. On the other hand, you could say, I kind of do it every day. Yeah, we do it every and day. And for some of our friends, they do it like five times a day. <laughs> like Father Gomer. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the thing is, though, you wouldn't do it. Yeah. Or you, you would try not to do it if you thought you weren't going to wake back up. Right, of course. Or if you thought when you woke up, mm-hmm. your life would be different. Right. 
So there's the metaphysical reality, there's the I haven't done it reality, there's the moral reality. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where I'm landing insofar as that if we don't trace the breadcrumbs back, if we don't trace the gifts back to the giver and begin to grow in a desire to actually live with him, because that's what faith, hope, and charity are doing, right? This, mm-hmm. this, this reality of the theological virtues in us, that, that we're going to come and make our home with you. He comes and makes his home with us before we make our home with him. Right. We're supposed to experience that on some level, that, that everything ultimately gets referred to him. And the extent to which it doesn't, I think, is the extent to which we have difficulty in the thought about dying. So basically, to kind of sum, sum up in a very high-level sketch, we're created to have this communion with God, to have this beatitude, this experience of um, fulfillment, this experience of blessedness. And we, uh, uh, we have effects of the Creator um, that are meant to bridge us to Him uh, and all the many things that we experience day in and day out. Uh, the many gifts in life, from just simple things like food and sleep and uh, uh, personal relationships and encounters and family and you know, all these wonderful, amazing things. Um, and oftentimes, we just get satisfied with the gifts and forget about the giver. But we're meant to make that bridge to the giver. And you're saying that St. Thomas uh, is saying that actually the most... Del- is it delight? Do you say? Do you use the word delight that you could have? Is reflecting on the Trinity and yeah, the extent to which we have knowledge in this life of the Trinity and the and the knowledge. incarnation of Christ. Um, the extent to which we know that is the extent to which we can have joy in that or beatitude in that. And the beatitude. Um, so it's, the, it's the where the bridge kinds, leads. The highest kinds of happiness in this life. Right, and so Saint Thomas is saying, climb the bridge and get there. Yeah. Right. Get to the one who gave them all. Get to the giver. Get to the Holy Trinity, the one who became incarnate. Um, and take the time to start to participate in that in that life. Yeah, it's, it's why I always say I have a sort of unease with bucket lists, I think I've mentioned before. Right? Yep, right. Because it's, it's this notion that the next life is going to be less interesting. Right, get it in now. Get, get it as much now, as you can. We're, we're just going to sit there and stare. We're just going to be bored after fire this. afterwards. Right. And clearly, that if all of these things are his effects, and we love all these things to various degrees, yeah. and love them rightly, if we love them in proportion to how good they actually are, <laughs> right? Um, then, and only then, could we think to ourselves, he is this thing infinitely? This thing perfectly, this right. thing that is the fullness thereof of life. Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not losing life. I'm. I'm gaining it. I, to begin to grow in a real desire, um, and it's not just the Trinity. Because the difficulty with the Trinity is that's 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 a concept you can't, by definition, have. You can't reason to the Trinity as you mentioned earlier. You can't have a concept because if you have a concept of it, then it's mm-hmm. less than what he is in himself. Right. And that's why the humanity of Christ is so incredibly important. As St. Catherine said, is that the bridge across which you, you get to the divinity of God. And those two things together constantly in our meditation. So practically speaking, I mean, looking at anything in creation, any of the things that you love, anything that bring you any kind of joy, take that into your prayer. And think, Why do I love this? Why do I enjoy this? And refer it back to him. Find it in him. What is this? How is this reflective of you? How did you create this? And in you is the fullness of this thing that I love. So I begin to grow in a desire for the sweet and blessed country. Yeah, I think that that's uh, beautifully said. I think, you know, as a practical way in which I approach my my prayer life when I'm reflecting upon the Trinity, which I, I do a fair amount, of course, you you look at God made flesh in the person of Christ but recognizing that he is looking back upon the Father uh, for which he is a perfect image of. Yeah. And that the gaze between the two being the Holy Spirit. And I, I want to, in my prayer life, insert myself in the gaze, in which case I've, I'm immersed in between, caught in the gaze of the Father, the Father to the Son, and the Son to the Father, and immersed 
in the experience of the gaze itself, which is the Holy Spirit. It's, of course, obviously, these are mental images yeah. uh, that are, that all fall short uh, because, you know, every Everything every <laughs> image is going to be more dissimilar than similar. Yeah. But it's something, yeah. right? And we're meant to grasp something. And that's just it, as you said earlier. The only reason to, to disclose the mystery, to reveal the mystery, is to have a possible disclosure of it. In other words, that I have this thing revealed to us, this fact that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this reality of realities, um, because I can explore it. Because every little small small insight that I gain in that realm is worth any information I have in any other realm, right? right. Because it's about the ultimate reality. Um, and it's not, I'm not meant to just throw up my hands and say, well, it's a mystery, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm meant to explore this reality and presumably, hopefully, explore it for all eternity. Right, exactly. Now, it's, it really is extreme. It gets to the heart of the matter. It does get to the heart of the matter. I think that most people will be left wondering after listening to the two of us talk, well, what does that have to do with me and you know, my prayer life? And I, I would say that what we would hope that people would gain um, in this conversation is first, this isn't so far above you yeah. because it's what you are made for. Right. Uh, it is far above all of us when you consider the disparity of our created nature and the uncreated God. But that's that, that's not the way we begin this journey because you, you, you can't simply say, I'm supposed to make this journey, but it's impossible. Yeah. Because if you say that, if it's impossible, then you're not going to make the journey. Yeah. So you can't begin there just with this, uh, this disparity between the na- our nature and God's nature. But you know that Christ, God, becomes man and bridges that and that we enter through Christ into this intimate relationship with God and that it requires a, a daily engagement there is a mental gaze I'm sorry um, I when I drive and I'm on a highway especially there's some back part of my brain that's driving it is not the front part <laughs> right I don't even know how yeah. I got from A to B right right so it's doing it, and and now with the aid of all these enhanced cruise control methods, it's doing it even more lazily than it's ever done before. Yeah. But the front part of my brain can be engaged in a rosary, can be engaged in meditation and reflection. And in that sense, you, you can drive on a highway and probably be more reflective and meditative than if you were walking on the side of the road, especially with all these enhanced cruise control yeah, things. Yeah. But the point being is that there's so many opportunities through the course of the day to be able to reflect upon, to be able to engage interiorly. Plenty of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and we can't, let's not discount the fact that, as you said, we're made for this. And grace is a kind of connatural principle, which just means that it's, it's with us like a habit, like any other habit is. Yeah. It's given to us by God. To begin to share his mind, right? Faith is the kind of sharing of the mind of God in, in, in our frail minds, but nevertheless. Right. And so to ask for that capacity to think on these things, to, to be enlightened by God, as to, to begin to know the persons of the Blessed Trinity and their oneness, but, in their, but also in their distinctions. And maybe one simple way to, to begin to do that is that let's just make deliberate signs of the cross. Right. I mean, it's a very simple thing, but if you attach to that sign of the cross that I want to know you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right. one God... Um, just thinking about that every once in a while when you're making the sign of the cross. Because we, you know, we're always swatting flies, right? When we make the sign of the cross. We do. Right. People see a Catholic, they don't know they're a Catholic. Like, what is he doing? <laughs> I love it. Like when a movie I see, uh, you know, there's whatever the movie is, and then it comes like a poignant moment, and people are having like a little religious experience where they're terrified. And you see one of the actors make a sign of the exactly. cross. <laughs> like, ooh, like one of, one of those extras as a Catholic. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like seeing that. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful thing to sign yourself with that um, and to think about what it is you're doing when you're saying that. It's a profession of belief. So, um, so as lofty as everything may have been in our conversation today, it's really not. It's the path you're on. Yeah. Um, it, and if you're an effective God. Yeah. Right. And this is where, of course, St. Augustine and St. Thomas find 
the, the perfect image of the Trinity. We won't go into it here. Yeah, right. But um, if you're an effective God and you're the highest creature that you know, in you is this reality stamped. Right. So it's it's pretty darn natural to you yeah. to think about the Trinity. It really is extraordinary. That having been said, I think uh, it's time for uh, before we go. Before we go, Father, I have to um, just say before we go Mm -hmm. that I had a wonderful macchiato here um, (laughs) offered by one of your wonderful assistants. um, We aim to serve. And we cannot put sufficient amounts of emphasis on the barista culture that is now coming (laughs) sufficiently to the United States. And I I could not be more happy about it. We had a wonderful donor when we first started the seminary that said, you know, Father, I've been with you through this process and I want to get the sisters something. What can I get them? And I said, I think you should get them. uh, Well, I don't know. I'll ask them first. But I had something in mind. But I don't Uh see what they would say. And of course, they said the same thing because they're they're coffee uh, junkies too. And they said, can we have an espresso machine? Well, I thought it would just be like a little espresso machine. And this man got us a, a Pavoni, which is a pretty serious espresso machine. But it has become, aside from the Blessed Sacrament, it has become the epicenter of our house. <laughs> is that? Yeah, oh, yeah. Because <laughs> everyone hangs out there and gets a coffee and talks. It's the, it's yeah. the, it's the modern-day water cooler, the whatever you want to call it. Um, Absolutely. But it, it creates such life in the house. Everyone's, you want a coffee? Yeah, let's go get a coffee. Uh, whether it's an espresso, macchiato, cappuccino, cafe latte, whatever. Um, and I, I'm glad to see that this has been brought now to the, to the heart of the diocese in the <laughs> Well, you have to thank Gretchen for that because she, uh, she's usually behind all of those improvements. Social improvements here. <laughs> yeah, she's gracious and courteous. So and if you all come to the chancery, make sure that you get yourself an espresso. Yes. Right? Well, it's actually, it's a, it's a new experience for me to be able to, you know, for her to say... If, you know, Father, would you like a espresso? Would you like a cappuccino? And it's funny because I feel like I'm in a piazza somewhere just because I'm being asked. <laughs> you know, if I <laughs> and it's like, wait a minute, am I at work? <laughs> That's great. Touches the life. Oh, it does. It does. All right. So before we go, I feel like I always bring up food. <laughs> I, <laughs> I just and well, so thinking, I'm going to stick with the trend. Thinking I, and talking is work. We got to get to food at some point. That's why yeah. I got to drink. I well, coffee. Well, that's it. I, right. I, I can bring up coffee because well, it's autumn. You, so getting, getting so I'll bring up a classic autumn food. When when I grew up in the autumn, you went apple picking. Mm. It was so much fun. Great memories. I remember that. Of course, it was well. gross a lot because there'd be like these rotten apples on the ground. You'd be stepping on them, that kind of mushy. But that said, it was a ton of fun yep. to get a bushel of apples. Um, Cider you, never tasted so good. Oh, oh, an apple cider donut. It's all. It's like a cake donut with crispy cut and. <laughs> fatty and everything it's delicious um but i the other day i was uh, i bought some apples and i was thinking to myself and i you know me i buy fruit and i, yeah. I buy apples but i don't buy them enough I, I i feel like there's more that can be done so one of my favorite ways to eat apples is an apple salad i like putting apples in my salad but i also like just chopping up a fuji apple which i think has a nice combination of crunch tart and sweet chopping that up putting some balsamic glaze, whether it's a white balsamic glaze mm-hmm. or a red balsamic glaze, taking some crumbled blue cheese and some roast or toasted walnuts and tossing it all together. And it is an unbelievable medley of flavor. Mm. You get the salt and pungency of the cheese with the sweetness and, and, the, and, the, and the, the brightness and a little bit of sour in the apple and the crunch of the walnut. It's just amazing. And you know, now I want to make an apple pie. <laughs> now, now, you know, I'm thinking like, do I make a strudel? I've never made a strudel before, but maybe that would be kind of fun. But I'm just thinking of different ways. Uh, but the the apple is extraordinary. So I'm just saying it's autumn. Yeah. It's time to get the apples. They're I in made season. homemade raviolis last week with uh, with uh, a pumpkin uh, mm-hmm. f- pumpkin and um, a hazelnut filling and oh, butter sage. On, uh, oh, pain. butter it sage! Was incredible. I would even eat pumpkin with that because I, I'm not a fan of the pumpkin flavor. Sorry, I'm a minority. I get it, but either I'm defective or but the we rest all have of the world is defective. But something's defects. wrong. It just does not work for me. The pumpkin flavor. Uh, but if I had the pumpkin flavor with butter and sage, yeah, and salt. 
even that sounds that sounds more than palatable. It sounds desirable. You want to get some food? I'm hungry. <laughs> yes, let's do that. God bless you all. all right. Have a great week. Enjoy. Take care now. Ciao. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time. From the Rooftop. Rooftop.